I uh, hope everybody is healthy and happy still. Getting getting into fall. Did not never expected the season to go quite like this, but what do you have? What can you do? I do want to make two more comments about programming. Um, the we co-host programming with North American Rock Garden Society Piedmont chapter here. And I noticed on our chat we've got Janice Swab has joined us, and she's going to be the next speaker for the Rock Garden Society, which is on November 21st, sailing from Canada to Greenland, Arctic warming in the Northwest Passage, which should be really fascinating. And if my talk next week about aeroids interests you, we're going to have a talk about another talk with the North American Rock Garden Society about aeroids presented by Brandon Huber, who's a graduate student here, and Jason Lattier, who's a former student and works at, the High, works at High Point University. They're gonna be talking about aeroid collection of the late Alan Galloway, who was local here. He passed away this year. Um, and he was a, a real expert on aeroids. And so they're gonna talk about his collection, which should be fantastic. All right, we're going to jump right into, into this. Now, I got to tell everybody, one of the hardest things about doing presentations and, and even doing plant sales with new things is people like to see pictures of plants and really new stuff we don't necessarily have pictures of. So I just kind of went through and picked some of the things that, that I really like out of the sale. I believe I went through and pulled everything that is no longer available in the sale off out of my talk, but um, if something shows up and it sells out, that was between the time of me putting this together and us talking. And I'll be happy to answer, and when I get finished, happy to answer any questions about any of these plants or anything else in our, in our sale. So let's jump right into it. You know, we, we, with our sales, we do a combination of new things, things that have been around for a while, tried and true, and, and then cutting edge. Sometimes we pick duds with the cutting edge things, but we try not to. Phenomenal plant, kind of living fossil, uh, the Dawn Redwood, Metasequoia Glyptostroboides. You can impress all your non-plant friends when you say that. This is the gold form. It's, it's been available in the U.S. trade for 20 years or so. And it's still a great plant. It's, you know, great as a specimen, that, those gold needles. It's great used here. I think this may be Graham Ray's garden up in Greensboro. But, you know, used as kind of a backdrop to the garden. So you have that bright color that everything else can play off of. Now it is like our native bald cypress. This is a deciduous conifer. So the needles will turn kind of a orange russet in the fall. You can see them just starting to in this, this photo on the right. And then they will, they'll all fall off. Nice small little needles. So, you know, it doesn't take much to deal with them. It's not like big oak or maple or magnolia leaves they just kind of kind of blow away so not a not a big mess which i like with them naturally they grow they like wet spots so you can put them near a pond but they really don't need that they're fine growing just about anywhere i don't have a picture of it we do have form of our our true our native bald cypress, uh, Taxodium disticum in the sale. We have one called Green Whisper, which really keeps the green, green foliage all the way through the season and then turns russet and drops its, its needles as well. I don't, I don't have a photo of that. That's a pretty new one, but it is a, it's a really neat plant. Speaking of plants that stay really nice and green, this selection of Magnolia virginiana, our native Sweet Bay Magnolia, from our friends at Hidden Hollow called Green Mile. 
Hidden Hollow Nursery is the nursery that we work with on most of our grafted trees, especially our red buds. They're the ones that we send up to bulk up our numbers or to increase things. So when we have something like our flamethrower red bud, we, we send uh, the wood there to, for them to grow. They are great plantsmen. It's father and son, Harold and Alex Neubauer, and they see a lot of plants and they do not select many plants. There's only been a couple of different trees that Hidden Hollow has introduced and every one of them is a great plant. They showed me this one, Green Mile, many years ago, probably close to 12 years ago. They didn't have a name on it, but they were, they were looking at it and said, we really like this plant. Dark, dark green foliage, really full habit, the backs of the leaves are really silvery and the way they're kind of held on the stems, you can see that silvery blue. And then it gets really nice fragrant white flowers over a pretty good period in the, the early summer. Really fantastic native plant. One of the very best sweet bay magnolias that's, that's available. And it's just becoming available in the market. It, but it is, it's a great plant. And if you go to a nursery and look at a row of them, they all look pretty much identical. Now, one people don't know very well, Cotinus obovatus. This is another native plant. What you mostly see, this is a, a smoke wood or smoke tree. The, the smoke, smoke bush you normally see is the European form, Cotinus or species, Cotinus cagigria. Cotinus obovatus is native now, so it has these really nice obovate leaves. When it flowers, it has it's this. You can see why they call it smoke wood. This is it in full flower. Now, unlike the European form, this, if you let it grow, will really want to be a tree. And if given enough time, it can be a pretty good sized tree but it gets phenomenal fall color. I mean, just amazing fall color. Like the, the European one, one way to grow this is to plant it and then every spring, cut it back down, you know, within a foot of the ground and it'll send up multiple stalks. The leaves will get really large and then you'll get this great fall color display in the fall. You won't get the flowers if you do that, but you can keep it smaller. Um, you know, you can grow it in a perennial border or something like that if you cut it back, or you can let it grow. This is it growing out in the open, actually in England. It tend, it's really more of an understory tree in, in the U.S. And this is one of the best deals we have in the, in the plant sale. These are most of these are five, six, seven feet tall, and we're selling them for pretty cheap. That's because if we don't sell them, we're going to have to pot them up into a bigger pot, and we don't want to do that. But really good plants, especially if you want native plants and you want great fall color. Uh, I've talked about this a few times, I think, over this summer, although it gets hard for me to remember who I've talked to about what, because I'm doing more and more of these Zoom calls and with no audience in front of me, it's, it all starts to look, it all starts to look like my screen. This is Magnolia serendipity. This, this was a plant that was sent to us from Bobby Green of Green Nurseries in Alabama, who's a, a great plantsman. He does breeding with a little bit with magnolias, I think more playing around with magnolias than anything else. Does a lot with, with camellias. But he sent us several magnolias some of which had names, some of which just had numbers. This just had a number on it. Some of the ones he sent us with names were, eh, they were kind of iffy. This one was amazing. It makes this big round ball, you know, in a decade, it's, it's gotten probably 12 or 15 feet tall and wide. Evergreen, in the spring, in about, starting at about early April, it just opens up these, creamy white, uh, slightly fragrant flowers 
all along its, its limbs. So if you can see in here, all these little rusty colored thing, those are all buds that are gonna open and it kind of opens from inside out. So if you get a cold spell and some get frozen, there's still more that are gonna open up. It's really, it's, it's an amazing plant. And we had to practically beg him to put a name on it. We finally said, if you don't name this, we're gonna name it for you because it is a great plant. The nurserymen here wanna grow it. We have a program with the Johnston County Nursery Association called the Choice Plants Program. And this is gonna be, this is one of our, our newest selections for that Choice Plants Program is this Magnolia Serendipity. It's been through cold winters hasn't phased it at all. The worst it's had is a little bit of, of tip burning. Crepe myrtles, you know, sometimes I have a hard time getting excited about crepe myrtles, only because where, where I used to live, they were so ubiquitous everywhere. It was a crepe myrtle. But some of these dark purple leaf ones are really getting good. This one, Ebony Embers, is kind of a, a, a mid-sized one. It grows about, oh, 15 feet tall. You can grow it multi-trunked or you can grow it single trunked. Good kind of watermelon, red, pink flowers on top of that, that purple foliage. I mean, it, that's really a good contrast. And, you know, it's flowering in midsummer, So that purple is holding up all the way through the summer. And what I really love is this is it right here grown as more multi-stemmed. You know, when you part, start putting it with different textures, you know, you got a perennial hibiscus and got an Amsonia up here. I can't remember what this is, this gold one is. I think that's a sweet, a gold sweet gum. You know, it really starts to, to showcase itself in contrast with these other plants. I just think that is spectacular almost enough to make me, me grow a, a crepe myrtle, even though I swore I'd never plant a crepe myrtle in my home landscape just because 70% of the street trees where I used to live were crepe myrtles. So I may have to break that vow though, because that is such a good plant. Fringe trees. I often talk about fringe trees. This Chinese fringe tree, one of my favorite flowering trees, and compare and contrast it with our native fringe tree, which is a great, great plant. But we have another southeastern native fringe tree, the, the dwarf fringe tree. It's Cyananthus pygmaeus. It grows on granite outcrops down in Georgia and into, into Florida and just makes this little tree. It's, it's pretty much just like our native fringe tree, except for at you know, a quarter scale. So it makes kind of a little shrub or you can grow it as a single trunk like this. So you get the little tree and you see these flowers hang down. Now, sometimes I talk about the difference between male and female flowers on Cyananthus. So this is a female. The flowers really hang down. Um, it's showy, but actually the male is even showier but the female gets you, get you the fruits and you can see you know it's a relative of olives when you when you look at that you can you can picture that whereas that's hard to tell that that's an olive so this is one that's being grown kind of shrubby this is one being grown more as a tree they can they, you can do them either way but they're just really cool plants they're I think they may be federally endangered so it would be illegal for you to ship them out of state but it's perfectly fine for you to drive them wherever you need to go. Just can't, can't mail them out of state. It's a great plant and it's perfectly hardy, even though it's from South Georgia, North Florida, it's, it's perfectly hardy for us and very easy to grow. Does like sun, the, our native French tree, you know, is a little more shade tolerant. This really prefers more sun than shade. Another little dwarf tree, um, shrubby tree, is Zelkova serrata goblin. And it's just a tight, dense form of Japanese, of the Japanese Zelkova. So it makes this little, little kind of ball. Over time, 
it can get bigger. This is, this may be the original. It's, it's one of the early ones out of Esveld. You know, that sign is probably sitting 18 inches tall. So you can see however long this has been there, 20, 30 years, you know, it's only gotten, it hadn't gotten real big. So it's just, you know, for people who like dwarf conifers and Japanese maples, it's kind of a no brainer for them, I think. A really neat little plant. Anything like this that's grafted and grown out, it, they get to be a little bit more expensive because it takes a little bit more work, but certainly, certainly worth, worth the price. Cute little thing. And then in the fall, Zelkova serrata, it can be variable for us. Some years we get a really nice kind of burgundy. Some years we get kind of burgundy more shot through with bright oranges uh, and some red. Some years we don't get a lot of great color at all. It, it really depends on the weather during that particular year as to what we will, we will get. If conditions keep on like they are, we should get some uh, pretty good color because typically what you want are clear days and cool nights. And nights have been cooling down very nicely for us. So if that trend continues, we could be in for a, a pretty nice fall here in Raleigh. Another one that I know I've talked about several times, the Elysiums. These are NC State introductions, dwarf Elysiums. Scorpio with red flowers, Orion with white flowers. Go to about four to five feet tall and wide. We may be, we're, we were real low on Scorpio. We may be selling out of those, but this white Orion is great. Very sun tolerant, very shade tolerant. Once established, they're very, they're pretty drought tolerant. And best of all, deer don't touch them generally. Never heard of a deer eating Elysium. Perhaps they do somewhere, but I've never heard of it. We've also got a variegated one in the, in the sale, Pink Frost, which is, which is a nice one. Most variegated forms the flower tends to be pink. Whether it's a variegated form of a white one, they tend to go pink for some reason, or a red one, they tend to go light pink. Uh, the nice thing about pink frost is it's got variegated leaves and then nice red flowers as well. Another kind of interesting one, and you know, this is one that we've sold a couple of times, and uh, it always surprises me that, that people aren't more interested in it. Distillium or Isu tree is, has really become super popular in the landscape trade. Upright ones, spreading ones, there's like Blue Cascade and Green Fountain and Linebacker and Cinnamon Girl and Coppertone and Emerald Heights, did I say Emerald Heights? They're just all kinds of them and, and garden centers are having a hard time keeping them in stock. Nurseries are having a hard time keeping up. Well, this spring frost is one that comes out kind of white, these stipple white leaves on kind of pink stems. Uh, really pretty, I think. And then it'll go green later in the summer and over winter. And, and in winter, you'll get these. Now, this is not on a variegated one. This is just the regular Distillium myricoides. But you get these red petalous flowers that are interesting. You know, I won't say they'll, they'll stop traffic, but they're certainly interesting. And back before distilliums became so widely grown, like every other year I'd get a picture sent to me or somebody would come into wherever I work and they'd have a, a piece of this and they'd say, what is this? And I'd say, where did you get it? Uh, nobody was selling distillium back, back before, but they are, sure are now. And this spring frost, I think, is just a very, very cool plant. You can plant it in shade and, and that white will kind of brighten up a shady spot. I think it's better with, with at least some light shade. Now, another great low plant for color is this Japanese holly. This is one of my very favorite ones. It's a little more architectural than some of the ones that are just, you know, a perfect dome. This is a sport, Ilex carnata adorned, is a sport of Hugendorn. 
Alex Cronata Hugendorn is widely considered the most, probably the most cold hardy Japanese holly. So people up farther north really like Hugendorn a lot. So this was a gold sport found by Pat McCracken named Adorned. This is it grown in kind of a, a scree garden, but we grow it just in ordinary soil and it does very, very well. We do have another one in the sale besides Adorned. We have Ilex Cronata Soft Touch Gold Sport. Really great name for it, right? Soft Touch is makes much more of a, a regular domed mound. And then it's got the gold foliage. So it's uh, it's just visually a little different. Smaller leaf, more of a uniform rounded habit than, than adorned. Both are great. Both look very different, even though they're quite similar, same species, same, more or less same color, but they are different. Also adorned actually is, is kind of a, is variegated with kind of a green center to the leaf. You can kind of see that in a couple spots in here, whereas the gold soft touch is the leaves are solid gold. Now, terrible picture of this, I know. I pulled it off of Spring Meadows website. So I'm always leery of gardenias because bad gardenias are terrible and people keep introducing them and mm, a lot of them are not very good. So my ears perked up when very good arboretum friend uh, and nurseryman Rick Crowder, I was up at his place last year and he had a couple of gardenias, he had some gardenias planted out and he said, yeah, these are some new ones. We're just looking at them and you know, seeing what they'll do. So I was talking to him about, about gardenias and was, he had a few different ones that I hadn't heard of before uh, this year. And I, I was gonna get some, he said, what you need to get is Snow Girl. It's like, I can save them for you, but it's, it's a really nice compact one. And it is super, super, super root rot resistant. Phytophthora root rot is what kills probably, you know, 80% of the gardenias in the landscape turn yellow and die. Uh, it's from root rot. And he said, this is just as root rot resistant as, as you could get. And he said, it, it absolutely covers itself in flowers. He said, the one we had looked at that they had planted outside the year before, he said, this year over the summer, when it was at full bloom, you basically couldn't see almost any green in there. And what you could see of green was mostly the buds coming up that were getting ready to open. He said he, said he was just blown away by it. And then it continued to put out flowers um, over the rest of the summer. That great gardenia smell. Yeah, when a nurseryman starts telling you how great a plant is, and he's not really trying to sell it, sell it to you, you know, perk up your ears because because they grow a lot of different plants and when they see something really good uh, it, it's usually worth paying attention to and Rick's good because he actually puts things in the ground he doesn't just tell you it grows well in a three gallon container another little dwarf evergreen kind of talking about these evergreens here is Pinus Mugo slow mound from Isley this is just kind of the you know, their, uh, whatever you call it, a little signage that you would put up in a, in a garden center, but figures if they introduced it, they know the most about it. You know, some things I would say, you know, they're out in the, in, in the Northwest. My guess is, you know, one to two feet in 10 years, they probably get a little bit larger. They tend to be a little bit larger for us, but everything I've seen with slow mound has got this really nice uniform habit. The funny thing about dwarf conifers like this is people tend to grow them like this with in conifer gardens, but they're great as you know just just evergreen parts in the landscape. They they provide a backbone. They you know they're they're just reliable and and evergreen so as long as you give it sun and and you know it has pretty good drainage it'll be great you know this would be beautiful with flowering perennials uh, or even annuals planted around it and growing and showing off against that dark green foliage okay some deciduous uh, shrubs 
We have one deciduous azalea in the sale. It's my Mary. My wife is named Mary, so that's why it's in the sale, because I want to buy one for myself for the garden. So sometimes that's how these things work. But I love deciduous azaleas. I think we should be all should be growing many more deciduous azaleas than we do. Most of them are are hybrids of our native azaleas, so they are mostly native. Butterflies and hummingbirds love these long tube throats, grow in shade, grow in sun, but they can look a little rough by the end of summer, but they flower really beautifully. My Mary's great because it has this two-tone effect with the, the orange-red throat, and then it flares open to these yellow petals. I just, it, it boggles my mind why we, people will buy, you know, just gajillions of little, the little evergreen azaleas and we just keep ignoring our, our deciduous ones. I think these are so much more interesting. They tend to grow a little more upright. They're perfect for growing small vines up through. I just, I love these. Next year, we might have five or six different deciduous uh, azaleas in the sale if I can find good sources for them or if we grow them out ourselves. Another native, I didn't even realize how many natives we were putting in there. And I will say, in this, if you look in this top left corner, there's another deciduous azalea, a nice pink one, looks like a rhododendron. Looks like maybe Vernardo's pink flocks. But we're here to talk about Father Gilla. Father Gilla X Intermedia is a hybrid, they're hybrids between Father Gilla Gardenii and Father Gilla Major. They make kind of midi, medium sized shrubs in the spring, usually, usually before the leaves emerge or as the leaves are starting to emerge. They put out these white bottle brush flowers, which are just deliciously honey scented, which I might add most of the deciduous azaleas are scented as well. And then as the leaves come out, you know, they, it shows off the, the flowers even more. I just, I think I would grow it just for that, but they're also one of the most reliable shrubs we have for fall color. So this is a fairly new one. Legends of the Fall, which, and this is pretty typical. These are both Legends of the Fall. This is pretty typical with Father Gill. It depends on the year. You get more of this yellow, orange, peach, or more burgundy, pink, red, orange, depending on the year. And also, when you take your photo, this may have been more dark like this earlier and then just got brighter and brighter. Great plants, sun to shade, really easy native. They don't have a lot of problems at all. And then this other one we have in, as well in the sale. This is one Blue Shadow. This has been around for a little bit longer. If you were to ask most people who grow Father Gilla what the, the best Father Gilla for us in the South is, they would tell you Father Gilla Intermedia Mount Airy which is a great one. Blue Shadow is a sport from, or, or a seedling, I can't remember which, from Mount Airy and has been a great grower for us and has that same great fall color, but look at this summer color too. It's just this glaucous kind of silvery blue, gorgeous, gorgeous plant. You can't ever go wrong with a Father Gilla in my mind. And they'll grow in, in pretty much full sun to, to pretty good shade as well. Look at this. When, this. when this geranium starts clambering through there and flowering with that color, oh, that's going to be fantastic. Okay, again, another 
another native plant, or at least a, a hybrid of native plant, Deer Villa. And Deer Villa, for whatever reason, just hasn't seemed to catch on, even though there's getting to be more and more, as well as some of the other, some other shrubs. But they're, they're native shrubs, kind of make, make a nice mound. It's a little bit looser than some others. Uh, this is one called Night Glow. The actual cultivar is El Madrigal, which I'm not quite sure what that is. El Madrigal is, is really just a stadium in Spain. If you took off the L and just did Madrigal, that'd be, you know, that's a, what, Renaissance era, Baroque era? I don't know. Some of you know, but made it better than me. Singing tradition, you know, without any instruments. I don't know. But when you put the L on there, it really is just a soccer stadium. But you get this, this burgundy, burgundy foliage, these bright yellow flowers that are great for pollinators. I think it's a real winner of a plant. Do it in sun to part shade. We have not grown night glow, so I don't know really how well the color holds up, but I've heard really positive things about it, but have not grown it ourselves here. And if you like those dark leaves and you want something small, you've got Wygela electric love. Again, this is one we haven't grown. So flowers in the spring, got burgundy foliage. They say it stays as a two foot shrub. Now, again, we have not grown this yet. Wygela usually gets, can get quite large, although they've been doing a good job of shrinking it, shrinking it, shrinking it. I would be amazed if in, you know, five years in good soil, and lots of sun, this thing is still only two feet tall, but maybe it is. But even if it does get bigger than that, you can cut it back after it flowers, let it reflush with new purple black growth. Flowers are, are gonna be amazing in early spring. That's a nice color for, for early spring. And I'm gonna stick one of those in my garden at home. I, I like that a lot and we'll see what it does. But pretty cool plant. Now we're gonna move into the kind of herbaceous stuff, but we'll start with kind of a shrubby herbaceous plant. You may be familiar with this, Mucella. This is kind of the shrubby form of banana. So these form kind of short pseudo stems with these, this great banana foliage on it. You can see there's my thing right in there, you see a little yellow, that's the flower and they reliably flower for us, these bright gold flowers. In a really warm, long season, you'll even get some bananas in there, but you know, they're more seed than banana, not, not terribly edible. But that kind of sits right on top of that pseudo stem and the leaves come up around it and then it'll sucker off to the side a bit as well. It loves sun, loves lots of moisture. I grow it both in the sun and in the shade. This is it at the Arboretum. It's, it's gotten to be a, a pretty good sized plant. A really cold winter can knock it back, but that just means you got, you know, it'll kind of start over right there, but they're, they're really very hardy. We, we love the plant. We think they're amazing. And I know some people when they flower, the cut a lot of the leaves kind of around there so you can really see that flower without having to come in there and, you know, spread the leaves apart, which may be a good way to do it. But uh, that's, that's so cool. And if you show that to somebody who knows nothing about plants, you know, that's from, you know, the total width of that flower is probably, you know, eight, 10 inches across. So it's, it's pretty, pretty darn showy. There is a orangey red flowered one that we, we tracked down in, from China. So we just put that, brought that to a nursery friend, friend to get into production today. So hopefully real soon in another year or two, we'll be offering you the, the orange 
flowered form of this as well. Another card I just downloaded. Figured it'd be the easiest way. This is a uh, Caryopteris or Bluebeard. This is one called Gold Crest. Was actually admiring this just today in a, in a garden. There's these gold leaves and then these really nice blue flowers. You know, one of my complaints for a lot of gold foliage plants with blue flowers is that the flower, it blooms late in the season. And so many of the earlier ones that we grew would, the foliage would come out and it would be gold and then it would turn green and then midsummer it would start flowering. And it wasn't that blue and gold that you really want that makes such a nice combination. This one really does hold, hold the gold very, very well. So when it starts flowering, it's still, it is still gold. You know, over ultimately about four feet tall or so. It, what I do is I leave them up for the winter. They can be a little susceptible unless they're in very, very well-drained soil. They can be a little bit susceptible to winter wet because they do go dormant for the most part. So I leave them and then when they start flushing out just a little bit in spring, when you start seeing any growth at all in spring, I cut it back really hard down to about six inches or so and let it all flush up again. And that way it keeps it from getting too big, keeps it from getting leggy, makes it dense and, and then it'll still flower. But, you know, it's, it's great in a, you know, kind of a, a water wise or drier garden as well. And, and pollinators love it, love Bluebeard. And if you like that gold thing, there's Aurelia cordata sun king. When this came out quite a few years ago now, there were a lot of nurserymen who said this, and, and gardeners who said this was the best new plant in years. Comes out, makes a almost a shrub, five to with a real happy one, eight feet tall and wide. Dies back to the ground in the winter. You just cut it all back. Best if it's getting some part sun, part shade. Uh, if it's in full sun, if it dries out too much, it can get burnt a little bit. If it's in too much shade, it doesn't, it isn't quite as gold. But if you can get that spot on the edge of a woodland or something like that, it's it's pretty amazing. It will flower. Now this is this is not the gold one, this is just the regular one, but it does this. It it flowers and then gets these purple fruits. So you get those, those purple fruits over that gold foliage. It's quite pretty. And then again, dies back during the winter. You know, a lot of gardeners are afraid of golden rods and don't grow nearly as many as they should. I think some people feel like they were burned by fireworks. Fireworks is a great plant, but it can flop. You either need to plant it, get it in a big enough mound where when it flops, it just looks like it's a big mound or stake it up or grow it through other plants. But this is one that's just known as Wichita Mountains. Nobody can quite figure out what it is. It might be a natural hybrid, it might be a, a new species. Uh, nobody seems to be sure, but it has these very upright stems with these bottle brush type flowers that stand up. It's, it's like it's a gold Leatris. So it'd be, it, it's in flower right now in the garden. So pretty. And it just like, it's, it's like looking at it through a haze when it's in flower because so many pollinators are around this thing. They just love it. And it makes really nice clumps that, that stand up really well. If you put it in a really super rich soil, it may stretch and flop, but put it in, in kind of a, your average soils, a little on the dry side, ideally. It just makes these beautiful clumps. And this, and this garden is, it's gorgeous, just, you know, kind of repeated throughout. It's, it's such a good golden rod. You know, a little bit more for shade, uh, although it can grow it in sun as well, is this pink octopus bellflower. This is another one that sometimes scares people. This is one of the punctata types and can, will, will spread. It'll form a ground cover if you let it. 
And I think it's gorgeous when people do that. And all you need to do after it finishes flowering, you guys do and you cut off all the, the flower heads. And one of the nice things about this as a spreading plant is it's very easy to pull up. If it goes where you don't want it, you just pull up, it's, it kind of grows out and makes a little rosette. You just pop that rosette out and it's the easiest plant to keep in control like that. And people will come out and see it in flower and say, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And you just go out and you pluck a few of the, the rosettes that are on the outside edge and give it to them. You don't even have to worry about it getting too big. But those flower stalks go up about 18 inches tall. And rather than the, the typical bell shape, the petals are very narrow on this. So it's a much more frilly look. I actually think it looks, in flower, it looks better than the typical bell-shaped punctata types. And then this one also, in addition to having the, the petals divided like that, the leaves have are much more serrate. So even when it's just the foliage there, which generally looks good all winter, you know, it's, it's got a little bit of a different texture. Again, I think this is an uh, A-plus plant. Now, those other two were, were fairly new. This is an old plant, a Jania pacifica, or sometimes it used to be chrysanthemum pacificum. This is a little mounding perennial, evergreen perennial. This is it in the middle of summer. You see that foliage. The foliage is very stiff, kind of pale green, the bottoms of the leaves, which you can see here kind of, the leaves kind of point up a little bit. So you see the silver on the bottom, but the silver also kind of rolls around that edge. So in the middle of summer, this thing looks like it's been just, you know, frosted, like it's, it's the first frost of the season. Beautiful little thing in, well, right around now, it starts flowering, these little yellow button flowers. Think of this as being a mum without any of the petals, because that's basically what it is. It's just, so it's just these little yellow things, but it produces a lot of them. And it starts in October or so and continues on. This is a picture I took of it in December. You can see it was a warm day in December, which is why I was out taking pictures. And you can see it's got pollinators on it at that time. The foliage has got some, some fall color, although I would not grow this for its fall color, but it's still got flowers doing their thing even into December. You can grow one as just kind of this little cushion or you can grow, you know, grow it as a mass. Like that first picture, it's beautiful either way. It's gorgeous around rocks. I just, I love this plant. I fell in love with it the first time I saw it probably 25 years ago and I still, still love it. Full sun, it's, I think it looks its absolute best if you put it almost like rock garden, scree garden conditions where it's, where it's really on the dry side and, and lean soil. That's where it'll be tightest and you'll get this really dense look like, like that. All right, now going into the shade. Again, I gave talks, I, I've talked about Ardesia quite a bit. We have two in the sale. We kind of went on either side of the spectrum. We have Andre the Giant, which is the largest one we've ever grown. It grows to eight or 10 inches tall. The biggest leaves we've ever seen on Ardesia or Marlberry. And then it gets these, these, little, these sweet little pink, white flowers and these fruits will turn bright, bright red. Andre the Giant has been a very, very good fruiter for us so we get a lot of fruit in there now the foliage kind of covers a lot of the fruit but you get enough so that you can see it and andre the giant has been one of the best spreaders for us it'll it'll spread quite quite well in good soil in drier soil you know with a lot of tree roots it's much slower to spread but once it's established you're gonna have to water it to establish it if you're doing it under trees i have seen this growing as a thick weed suppressing mat like this under Asian evergreen oaks, which are a tough place to grow because it is, there's no light that gets through and they are sucking up the moisture all year round. 
In a real cold winter, that might burn the tops off. Just if that happens, you run over it with a lawnmower. In the spring, it'll pop back up, no problem. On the other end of the scale, we have this one called Angiopixie, which is the smallest one we grow. Previous to Angiopixie, the smallest one we grew was Shiramen. But this is, has a smaller leaf, smaller statue than Shiramen. It's, it's really about two to four inches tall. The, the interesting thing is, you see here, you get you know, a couple of flowers on there that'll form fruits. This flowers quite heavily for an Ardesia. So it'll be interesting to see whether that is going to happen every year and it'll fruit a, a lot. We haven't been growing this for a terribly long time, so we're still watching it. But perhaps just because it's so small and closer to the ground, it tends to be hardier than, than a lot of the other ones uh, in terms of its leaves. It doesn't burn back almost ever in our winters. And again, it spreads to form a great ground cover. So whether you buy one and let it, you know, make a, a 12, 18 inch mat, or you buy 10 of them and space them out and, and you know, get it to make a really beautiful small scale ground cover. Either way, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, amazing. Now this is a terrible picture and I was sure I had good pictures of this and I do not. Um, this is a hard plant to take pictures of. Farfugium japonicum, you may know that as the leopard plant. Usually it has the little yellow dots all over the leaves. Well, this one has no yellow dots on its leaves, but Shishi botan, the leaves are incredibly crested. The edges are all just ridged and crested and kind of curl up on themselves. And so I mean, most people who look at this when it doesn't have any flowers say, say it looks like kale. To which some would respond, well, why grow it? To which I would respond, Cool, it's a leopard plant that looks like kale and it in kale, I, that's cool. But one of the things I really like leopard plants for is that right now they're coming into flower. They're just sending up their flower stalks right now. And so October and November, you'll get these gorgeous gold asters, whether they're in sun or part shade, and then they'll become little white puff balls of flowers that will actually stay on the on the plant if you leave them through a good part of the winter and I think are very very pretty. It's just you know there isn't a lot that's looking fresh and nice at this time of year and these really do. If they're in full sun in a dry spot they, they do like a little bit of extra moisture but in part sun they're 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 fine all season long. And finally, pitcher plant. You know, I know not everybody is interested in growing carnivorous plants, but this Saracenia, I think, is such a neat one. Saracenia cortii. This is a naturally occurring hybrid from down along the Gulf Coast, named for the plant propagator at Vetch Nursery in, in the UK when it was discovered. It's kind of interesting, very, very red pitchers that always want to lay almost flat. So it's a really good one to grow in a container or to grow multiples of so they kind of grow together because it doesn't grow real upright. And then in the spring when it flowers, it's these amazing upright burgundy flowers. This is one of the best pitcher plants for just the foliage color of any that are out there. And it's like this basically all the time. And they're not difficult to grow. If you grow them in a container with a, a soil that's got a lot of peat in there, keep it moist. I know some people do just plain, they do peat and sand. There's a lot of recipes on the internet you can, you can do, um, you can find, and you just plant them in that and just make sure it, it doesn't dry out. And they do wonderfully like that. Um, and once you start growing them, you really start getting addicted to them and wanting to grow more and more. And if you become one of those people, you'll start, you know, putting liners in and filling that up with with peat and growing them, or or putting like some people I know sinking bathtubs all over your garden and growing them in there. They can be a lot of fun. As always, I'll end with, if you can't wait to get plants, we do have plants. We'll have plants out tomorrow in 
on our plant cart out front, we've got a hardy begonia. I would not plant this right now. I would keep it indoors and plant it in the spring. It's a real showy one. And when we say hardy begonia, we mean hardy-ish. Great evergreen vine, Cadsura longa pedunculata, one of my favorites. Double flowered Lycoris. Well, I don't know, double. They're kind of frilly, so they give you that look, but it's one of the, the real early ones. A great little evergreen, which don't sell well on our cart for some reason, but this, this is an upright Thuya or Platycletus, the, the, the Asian form of Thuya that comes out bright yellow and then goes yellow green. Oxblood lilies, Rhodophyalla which are flowering all over the arboretum right now. I wish y'all could see them. And then Rastranucula dependens, which is kind of this arching plant with these, these long cascading lavender flowers. Very, very unusual looking. And we just cut it back during the winter and then let it, let it go again. Cool plant. And then before I answer questions, I do want to plug our fall symposium. Symposium is coming up November 14th. It is a great cast of characters. It's, there's any of these speakers are, would be worth regist registering for any program because they, they are all amazing and they're all really quite different kind of gardeners and thinkers and speakers. So it'll be a lot of fun to talk about them. I didn't have, I wasn't able to talk about all the plants that are in the sale. Obviously there are just so many. A few things that I didn't mention that I think are very cool. We have caladiums for forcing. We have the, from one of the best caladium growers in Florida, Bates and Sons. We have bags of either three or five, three jumbo or five number one palladium bulbs for forcing. Um, we have all the directions for that. They're super easy to, to force. And you start them, when, when we get, you'll get them at the end of the month. And if you start them then, they will be full and beautiful for the holiday season. So we pick ones that would be, you know, uh, that, are give a little bit something different than poinsettias, you know, and these you can hold on to and plant out in the garden, dig up and hold over for the winter and plant out next year as well. So much easier than keeping poinsettias over the winter. All right. So there weren't too many questions in the chat, Mark, and I think I addressed them all, but Marilyn had a two-part question that maybe you can add on to. She was asking if the goldenrod would do well in her clay-based soils that she's improved by adding organics, and will it handle a little bit of shade? The soil should be fine, fine, as long as it doesn't hold too much water. If you're growing other uh, things like, like goldenrods, then you should have, have no problem. Will it handle a bit of shade? It won't want too much shade. It's, it's really more of a, a sun lover. Oh, the, the small windmill that is being offered in the sale. Oh yeah, Sable Minor Chipola, 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 I don't know. Chipola Dwarf is just a naturally occurring dwarf form of our dwarf cabbage palm it grows to about two two and a half feet tall the the fronds will go a little bit wider on it so the four feet is fine it's it's it is just a smaller form of our our sable miner it's really nice i i grow i don't grow multiples of many things but i've got three of those growing at my house and something that people people forget about, Sable Minor, um, actually most palms that are hardy here 
the windmill palms, the, the sable, sable minor are great in shady gardens. They do very, very well in, you know, if you have high shade in the garden. The, you can plant them in full sun, but, but they do just fine. And they'll tolerate, you know, periodic inundation as well. They're, they're perfect for rain gardens. Anything else? Is there a common name for Deer Villa? Do, I, don't, I don't know. Do we have a common name for it, Chris? I'll look that one up. <laughs> I don't know. Bush Honeysuckle. Bush Honeysuckle. There you go. Terrible, terrible common name because then people are afraid that it's like a honeysuckle, which it is not. But it is in that I believe it's in that Caprifoliaceae family, so it's going to be great for pollinators like honeysuckle is. But it's, but it's a native, it's a native, they're native plants. Other questions? What else is on that list that is amazing? There's so many things. I want to talk about so many things. A lot of them I just didn't have pictures of. Oh, we have great tubas, uh, aspidistras. So many good things. Every time there's a sale, you get a peek into my brain because <laughs> often I pick the, the plants. And so you see a lot of the things that I like. Sometimes I have to specifically go for things that I don't, don't like. The clematis that we have in here, we have a couple of kind of mounding clematis, which are great, more, more like you're going into perennials. Arabella, but these other ones, I don't, gr I haven't grown Prince Charles, but I have grown Princess Kate, and kind of that's kind of out of the same series. If it is one third as good as Princess Kate, Prince Charles should be phenomenal because that's a great little plant. Marianne just asked if you can provide any information. Any additional information about the Syningia and the um, Saxifragia? Okay, yeah. So the Syningia, I'll start there. For some reason, on some seed lists that I was getting, I um, this is Syningia eumorpha. I ordered this Syningia off this seed list apparently multiple times. <laughs> uh, so we had a whole bunch of them and we really didn't think they were hardy at all. So we stuck them in the ground and they have only been through the last two winters. So I, we, that's why we put semi hardy on there because they haven't been through a cold winter for us, but they have sailed through the last two winters. Every single one we've planted, every single one we have planted here at the Arboretum, ones I planted at, at my house, ones that other folks have planted because we have, have sold the, some of these. Everybody has been said they've been coming back both in fairly deep shade as well as pretty bright sun. And they come up and then they have kind of big fuzzy leaves. And then about midsummer, they start with these great big white flowers and keep going. They're still in flower right now. We, and what we found is some of the, the, the hardier syningias like pink pockets and some of those are bred with syningia eumorpha. That's part of where they get the hardiness from. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how this, how cold hardy it is, but it's, it, it's often been grown as a house plant as well. So it makes a very easy house plant as well really like this. <laughs> we got a lot of those. And then the, the saxifrage, the strawberry begonia. Another great plant. You know, I, I learned strawberry begonia as a house plant. It's great as a house plant. You know, you put it in a basket and it hangs over, grows down, it spreads rhizomes and, you know, then little, little, rosettes of leaves that it'll just hang in the air but you can just plant it outside here which blew my mind when i learned you could do that many 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 years ago 
So I love strawberry begonia. Hope's wine is one that has kind of purple to purple streaked leaves and real purple backs to the leaves if you flip it over. And then it has these kind of airy white flowers, but it's evergreen. So it's uh, like an ever a ground cover for shade, an evergreen ground cover for shade. And when you get a lot of it planted out and it comes into flower, one plant, the flowers are kind of nothing, but I had, I worked at one garden where we had probably, you know, 150 square feet of, of this uh, with just nothing but, but strawberry begonia. And when it flowered, it was just this whole beautiful haze over that evergreen foliage. Really great plant. Any other questions? Sally asked if they could plant or she could plant clematis right now. Oh yeah. Yeah, you can, anything that's, most of the things on this list, you know, are great for planting right now. Really the, the syningia you might not want to because if you get a cold winter, but most everything else, I would, I certainly would plant it. Yeah. One, another one that I didn't put, this Tricertus fluffy orchid. Don't know what anything about I, I saw this down in Atlanta at, at their Gainesville garden. I was like, what is this Tricertus? This is insane looking in flower. Huge flowers, tons of them on a fairly upright plant. And uh, it was looking clean and good. it looked good at the end of the season when it was in flower, which they don't always do. And got a bunch of cuttings of it. And now we have enough to offer y'all. I, I think it was probably bred for cut flowers, not really as a garden plant, but like so many things that were bred for cut flowers, they actually are great in the garden because it is so floriferous and it tends hmm. to stand up. And Carolyn simply said dogwood reviews. Sounds like she might want you to add a couple of comments about the dogwoods in the sale. I will add some comments about the dogwoods in the sale. The first comment I will add is that I believe they're sold out. But let's see, which ones do we have? Cherokee uh, Princess. Oh, yeah. Sam so, Zam. Cherokee Princess is one of the, the OG named pink flowering, I'm sorry, red flowering ones, excuse me, white flowering forms. I'll get it out eventually. Um, but it's, it's was one of the early ones that was named. It's still very, very good. It's, it's got large, large flowers. It, it usually fruits very well. It's, it's a great plant. It, it, you know, it was selected for heavy bloom, which it does. Uh, you know, it's not as as mildew resistant as some of the the more recent ones, but it is a, a great plant. And then the Cornuscusa Samzan or Samaritan Cusa dogwood. This is a a really good variegated anthracnose resistant plant. Gets good fall color. Both both of these uh, dogwoods do. Both good plants. I believe they're both sold out though. Other questions? Well, that looks like it takes care of all the questions, Mark. Thank you so much for a great presentation. All right. Thank you all. And for those of you who are members, we are officially opening this up to non members now. Members have, have had access since Saturday and have, we've had a great response. Now we are opening it up to everybody. So if you're a member and you haven't gotten your plants, get it now before we really blast it out all over social media and everything. And if you're joining us and are not a member, first, welcome. And we hope that you consider joining us and supporting us, but also you are welcome to shop the, the sale now. And Carolyn just asked, how does she shop? And I gave the URL out before, and I'll give it again right now. 
there is an e-store for the um, for the plant sale. So yes, and you so you, you need to you will need to log in to to do this. It's all you pay through the the site and do everything through the site. And pickup will not be until the end of the month. I know that that drives some people bonkers, but we learned in the spring that if we jam them too close together, it causes incredible, incredible heartache for our staff. And we, we just gave away 6,000 plants to our members. And if we cause heartache for Doug and Tim right now, we may be advertising for new, for new garden staff. So we do this, give it a little bit of a, of some space in between so that we can have everything really organized. And Catherine Wall says she'll be emailing, every, emailing everybody with the dates and hours for pickup. And it is pickup only. If anybody's joining us from far, far away, it is pickup only. It is, we are not mailing any plants. Rosanna just asked, how does she give? And the uh, plant sale e-store does have uh, memberships that you can uh, make a contribution for right there at the uh, first three levels. Otherwise, you can do it on our website for higher levels. And I think there's even a section for general donations, isn't there? I believe so. But I think she didn't get everything out. The giveaway went very, very well. We were not sure how it would go. It took a lot. It took a lot on the on the the back end on our end to to really um, make sure it went smoothly. But staff, I mean, there were meeting after meeting on how are we going to do this, when are we going to do that, how are we going to get the plant. I mean, just the logistics to to make it all happen, and then it happened just like we we always hope it will, where everybody who who participated, at least everybody we've heard from, said, "Wow." That was fantastic. That was so easy. Thank you for doing this. I'm glad it was so easy, which is a sign of our staff doing a great job is when it, when it all seems so, so easy. It was easy. Linda, I was looking for you on this. Why did you not say hello to me? I, I didn't hoping. see you. I was hoping to meet you and or Chris. And uh, I didn't see either one of you. I came, you know, at like 11.30 or 11.45. I was, I was out there and somebody, uh, I think Arlene said, that was, that was Linda Patton. I was like, ah, that's, I, I was looking for her. I've only, I've only seen you through this, through the, the computer screen. Chris was oh, not right. there. Chris, yeah, uh, I, looked, I looked around, I didn't see either one of you. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I was sorry I missed you, but I only missed you by about, you know, 30 seconds. Well, it was worth the 232 mile drive. Woo, 232 mile, that's, well, good. I'm glad it was worth it. That's, we- Yep, we so 116 it miles one way. <laughs> the giveaway- I'm so thrilled. I got, giveaway. I have, I have one plant that's a mystery plant that I need to send a picture to you and Chris and the leaf looks a little bit like a hydrangea, but it's kind of small for, but it's a small plant. So I'll send you, you gentlemen, a picture and see if you can help me with it. Yep. Yep. Send me the, send me the picture and we will, we'll definitely uh, get that figured out for you. But I got a, one of the uh, Magnolia Virginiana. Mm -hmm. I'm really thrilled with that. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, there were a few people who've participated in our normal one who've emailed and said, we kind of liked it where we got a surprise bag that we didn't know what we were, what we were going to get. And, and we may figure out a way to incorporate that in as well, because, uh, you know, it's sometimes fun to be surprised by, by what you're getting. Yeah, that was fun. Well, I'm glad you said it was worth it because Arlene was a little concerned. She said, she told me that was you. She, she, she knew you from these as well. And she said... Linda said she she drove uh, from uh, you know a couple hundred miles for this, and she hoped it was worth it. So we were we were waiting to hear whether it was. So Tell her I'm yeah I'm thrilled. I'll with pass it. that on to all the staff. It's and I, I'll see y'all next time. Fantastic. Well, we'll see everyone next week at three o'clock. That's right. Okay, Thank another another wonderful session. Thank you. 
Thank y'all.